How many of you out there have seen these inexpensive electronics project kits offered for sale on sites like eBay? Have you ever wondered if they're any good? Well, I certainly did. Hello there, everyone. You've tuned in UXW Bill, and in this video, we're going to be talking about one such inexpensive electronics kit. This particular kit that you're looking at right now is actually an electronic clock, and it is offered under a variety of different names. Some of them reference what appears to be the model number, SH-E879, while other listings you may find out there refer to it as an Atmel microcontroller-based clock. Odds are you could probably also find one if you tried searching for a microcontroller clock kit or simply a digital clock kit on eBay and you spent a little bit of time poring over the results. The question that we're here to answer today, of course, is are these kits actually worth buying? And that's a very valid question because I bought two of these particular kits and they cost me less than $8 delivered, which is really kind of amazing when you think about it. And even at that price, it wouldn't necessarily matter if the kit was made of pressed and dried garbage, although any of us would certainly hope for a bit more than that. The good news is, to make a long story short, I can say that these kits are generally worth buying with caveats. I will get into those a little bit later, but first, let's go ahead and take a look at what you get with one such kit. They basically include everything you're going to need and then some. This is the second kit that I bought. It's still packaged. I haven't assembled it yet. And if we look here, you can see there are a couple of displays in there. There are some LEDs, some other passive components such as capacitors, resistors, a diode or two. There's a diode over there, in fact. There's even a battery holder for the CR2032. And in a rather surprising departure from what you get with most inexpensive electronic products delivered from overseas, you actually do get the battery, and I think most of the time they don't include the battery because there's some sort of a restriction on air mailing those things, or mailing them in any way, shape, or form, and it's simpler for those sellers not to have to bother with such things. I don't know what the people who sell these are doing if they're simply skirting the regulations and flying under the radar, but they did include, however questionable its quality might be, an actual CR2032 battery. That brings me to my first caveat with this particular kit. As you can probably guess, these predominantly come from sellers located in the Pacific Rim, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, countries such as those. And over there, of course, they by and large speak Chinese. Well, one of these kits does come with a set of instructions. I'll try not to spill any parts out here. As well as the printed circuit board, which is actually wrapped up inside here. The printed circuit board itself looks to be pretty well made. Mine took solder well when I put it together. And yes, here in the United States, the L within solder is generally regarded as being a silent letter. But, as I said, caveats. Every last stick of instruction that you get with this kit is in Chinese. Now I suppose that if you happen to be even somewhat fluent in Chinese, that's probably not a problem for you. But if you're like me, and I suspect that most of you are, you don't know a stick of Chinese, and you probably don't know a Chinese person who could help to translate it for you. Luckily, all is not lost, although I would definitely say the lack of any English instructions, however ham-fisted the translations might have been, they would have been better than nothing. That makes this a kit that is not really suitable, in my opinion, for someone who is just beginning to study the art of assembling electronics from kits and developing a working understanding of circuit theory. The kit itself is pretty easy to build if you've ever done anything with electronics before, but if you're just starting out, the lack of instructions is definitely a problem. And a little bit of a digression here, because I get a lot of people asking me about this. How did I learn to solder? Can I do a video about teaching you to solder? Well, no, I'm not going to do those things because I don't consider myself that good at it. In fact, if we look at the solder points on the back of this kit, you can see that they are indeed serviceable, but the solder dots are far from uniform in size, and they're not especially neat either. So I don't really think I should be the person going around teaching people how to solder, especially since there are some things that are still foreign to me, such as handling surface soldered devices. Although I did once re-solder the surface-mounted display controller in a Kenwood home theater receiver, and despite my best efforts, the thing actually survived and still works to this day. It's up in my entertainment center right now. Getting back to the subject, though, 
The print board that this kit comes with looks to be well made, and it does at least have the component values on it, and in the case of the kit that I bought, it appears that all the component value markings on the board are correct. Or if they're wrong, they're not wrong enough that the kit fails to work with a few things in the wrong place. Although I definitely think that I got everything in place correctly on this. Caveat number two. As with any of these inexpensive items that you get from sellers located overseas, the person or company who is selling them to you may not have anyone on their staff who speaks any English or English that's good enough for you to converse with them. There are certainly always exceptions to this rule. But I have heard reports that people have gotten these kits with microcontrollers that were programmed incorrectly. They were programmed for something else. You will also find, based on this Atmel microcontroller that is used in this particular kit, that there are temperature and humidity sensors, alarms based on temperature and humidity, all sorts of things. And it's not too hard to imagine. In fact, we know for sure that it does happen, that the wrong microcontroller ends up in the wrong bin or ends up programmed the wrong way in some sort of interesting way. And you get a microcontroller that doesn't function as a clock, doesn't fit into the circuit that you've just assembled, and confused performance is oftentimes the result. Fortunately, there is a project online where someone has put together a working firmware, I assume, I haven't actually tried it myself, that can be programmed into these particular Atmel microcontrollers. I believe they have flash memory, so reprogramming an incorrectly programmed one is not the end of the world and you can get a working clock in that way. If you're familiar with the code used by these particular microcontrollers, you could also considerably extend the functionality. The microcontroller is at the heart of a third caveat associated with these things. You've probably noticed, and in fact I pointed out earlier, that there is a CR2032 battery socket available on these. This socket does not serve to operate the clock. Rather, it's supposed to provide memory backup. And if it worked even half as well as, say, the 9-volt memory backup in a typical bedroom-style clock radio, which my experiences have not been too positive with, it would probably be acceptable. What I have found, though, is that the CR2032 battery, especially the one that ships with the kit, just doesn't have enough power delivery capability. The microcontroller is too power hungry even when operating at reduced voltage and it doesn't contain a secondary voltage input to maintain its registers and to keep its core running even at a reduced clock speed. So when your primary power source fails, if it fails for any length of time, more than an instant or two, what's going to happen is that the microcontroller will crash. It'll just lock up. The display won't run, nothing will be happening, and you'll have to pull not only the CR2032 battery, but also your primary power source to make the clock work as it should once again. Nothing gets damaged, but it's kind of an irritating situation, and again, to someone who is new to electronics, it could be rather alarming if they think that the kit has broken down on them. I mention this because I decided to run my particular kit from four AA batteries. That's a total of 6 volts. These kits contain an onboard linear voltage regulator. It's located right here underneath this capacitor and the terminal block. It's a simple linear 7805 5 volt positive output regulator. Very low tech, but it certainly works. It does have a minimum voltage difference that my 6 volt battery hookup back here didn't quite meet, so the regulator was never doing anything terribly productive but all of the circuitry on the board, including the microcontroller, seem to be content with running pretty near their rated maximum voltage limits. However, the batteries do get pulled down pretty quickly. I tried varying brands, inexpensive Chinese private label batteries from a grocery store, all the way up to Duracell's Rayovax. I meant to try some energizers, but I never got those. And what I found is that regardless of the battery brand, which kind of surprised me, I expected the name brand batteries to do quite a bit better. They were all alkaline batteries, no carbon zincs or anything like that, or zinc chloride batteries. They all lasted about the same length of time. This thing would run for about 10 days before the batteries gave out. What was interesting was that each particular brand of batteries ran down in a different way. Some of them were able to keep these time separator LEDs which are solidly lit and they do not flash. 
Some of them were able to maintain enough voltage and current to keep those going, while other brands of batteries let these run down to the point of darkness. That is to say, they could no longer overcome the limiting resistor that's in series with those separator LEDs. But any, in any case, all of the batteries that I used with this managed to last about 10 days. And of course, by the time that the microcontroller had run out of sufficient voltage and current to keep the display going and the time updating, it latched up and failed to work properly because the CR2032 battery, especially the cheap one that comes with this, just can't hold enough current, just can't provide enough current to keep the microcontroller running the way that it should. All in all though, this thing was pretty easy to assemble, and I guess what we should do at this point is hook it up and see what it looks like in action. We'll also talk a little bit about the user interface. I will be back to discuss those very exciting subjects. I have returned in a particularly expedient fashion thanks to the magic of video editing. As you can see, I have just hooked the clock up to the battery and it has started running. It's only been connected for a few seconds at this point. I do have something that is of a rather convoluted nature going on here, primarily because, as many of you are undoubtedly aware, not only am I a professional bad example, I am also a professional lazy person. That's kind of a sideline for me, actually, but I'm still pretty doggone good at it. Doesn't matter. The clock's hooked up, it's got power, and that means we can take a look at the user interface. Every action that you perform with this particular clock is performed by the use of one touch button over here. It's actually a little micro switch like you'd find in a computer or mouse or something along those lines. And it sounds very similar when you push it. If you push the button once and hold it for just a brief period of time, you enter the setting mode and you can actually start by setting the minutes. During this time, the seconds actually freeze. If you want to try and synchronize this with something such as WWV or its equivalent in your part of the world, or you want to synchronize it against a network time protocol server or a computer with an accurate clock, before you enter the setting mode, you should let the seconds value roll over to zero, and it will remain frozen and in the setting mode for as long as it takes for you to complete the setting operation. It never jumps back out to the regular mode of operation. I have noticed that if you try to set the time too quickly for the hours or minutes on this particular clock, that it will have some trouble with that, it may actually jump out of the setting mode entirely, or it may switch to setting hours instead of minutes or something along those lines. So you do have to take your time and be kind of patient with it, otherwise the microcontroller may misinterpret what it is that you are trying to do. We'll go ahead and I'll step through the minutes here. If you hold down the button, it does not repeat. It cannot repeat because of the way that the microcontroller has been programmed. Now this is a 24-hour clock. That is to say that instead of being set for 0 to 12 hours and cycling over again as the switch to AM or PM, this thing counts 0 through 23. So if you're not good at military time, well, guess what? You're going to get to be pretty good at it if you expect to use this clock successfully. Go ahead and switch over to the hour setting mode here. I held the button for about a second. And now I can go ahead and I can cycle through the hours. And then when I want to exit the hour setting mode, I just hold the button down for about a second. I release it and it kicks me out. I can re-enter the setting mode very easily. I just did by holding the button down there for a second. I did that mainly so it would read 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, just because I have a weird sense of humor like that. <laughs> Amazingly enough, maybe even surprisingly enough, this thing appears to keep exceptional time as long as it's got a stable and reliable power source. I don't think you can expect the backup battery to work well at all. Although if you wanted to, you could certainly install a larger set of backup batteries. All in all, would I recommend that you purchase this kit? Well, if it's not your first go round or you're feeling brave, certainly. Heck, for three and a half dollars delivered or thereabouts, if you shop around and shop carefully, it's hard to go wrong even if you never end up assembling the thing or if you break it beyond all repair in the process. No doubt you'll have learned something, even if only what not to do the next time. 
So I have a pretty high opinion of this electronics kit. I think that it's a great introduction for almost anyone, especially if that person is not afraid to jump in with both feet. And the quality seems surprisingly, if not unbelievably good, for the price that you pay. So thank you very much for watching. I certainly hope this particular video has been both of informative and useful to you. And as always, I encourage you to leave a comment if you have one.